Wondering how ETFs can fit into your portfolio? Join us for our Fall into ETF Investing event, a four-part YouTube series premiering on October 18th, 2024, designed specifically for DIY investors. Check out these exciting weekly events we curated specifically for you, the DIY investor. Our special guest speakers and insightful industry experts will provide the information and education you need to gain confidence and empower you to manage your portfolios. You won't want to miss these weekly specials. Hey everyone, it's Larry Berman here. Um, another very, very interesting week on markets everywhere from uh, what Warren Buffett just bought to uh, earnings warnings to earnings surprises. Uh, let's dig right in and see what's on my radar and what we're looking for in the week ahead. I normally don't focus on Canada because the U.S. drives the bus in, in the sense and for the most part, we're, we're just passengers on that bus. Uh, but this is a uh, interesting week for the Bank of Canada. Uh, expectations for uh, the meeting this week: 189% chance that the Fed cuts, or that the Bank of Canada cuts the target rate by 50 basis points. So, you know, we're 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 seeing a big impact, yet you're you're not you're not getting it. You know, you don't hear it from earnings. You know, in, in Canada, we just don't get this kind of feedback generally like we have in the U.S. market where these big behemoth companies that have tentacles in, a, in all, all parts of the world are reporting. And, you know, you hear from, from Netflix about what's going on in Asia and, and clients in different markets. And, and same thing, I mean, no shortage of, of information this week in the coming out of the semiconductor with the, the news on ASML uh, on the downside, followed by Taiwan Semi on the upside. And, you know, you, at least you're wanting to rip your hair out because, you know, there, there's, there's just so much information to digest. But when we get into Canada in our little 3% of the world capital markets and our foolish leader who uh, is a, an outright embarrassment on the world stage. Um, if I've offended anybody by that statement, he's offended me over the years. Anyways, forget that political nonsense. Um, going back to the Bank of Canada. So obviously Canada is in far, far worse shape than the stronger numbers uh, that we got this week out of the U.S. for retail sales. Um, weekly claims that, that shot up last week came back in a little bit, but maybe that trend is turning. Again, trend could be measured in months and months and months and maybe quarters before it's meaningful. So market right now like just doesn't care. But for Canada, a more aggressive rate cut path is, is coming. So the biggest place where that's going to be impacted is the Canadian dollar. And so, you know, a couple of weeks ago, literally Canadian dollar, people were talking about, you know, it, it's going to go back above 75 cents and, and everything else. And, you know, that, that obviously never made sense to me, but when we look at rate differentials, this, this white, this green line here, this is the spread between two year Canada and two year treasuries. And when that line goes up, Canada yields are, are lower than in the U.S. And so that is a uh, capital flow. Um, so Canada has a trade account and a, and a capital account, so current account. And so on the capital account, this is buying and selling of Canadian assets from abroad and you know, bonds and equities in Canada. And if we're getting a weaker currency here, you know, you're, you're going to see less and less of that flow. And so a weaker currency um, drives that. I, so I think the Canadian dollar is going to have a date with the highs that we saw, the low levels for the Canadian dollar traded terms highs, um, maybe this week. So for the snowbirds out there, 
this is not a great time to be, you know, locking in your U.S. dollars. It was, as we were saying down in here, a uh, much better opportunity, you know, to, for, for people who bought those U.S. dollars. So is it going to break through? Boy, I wish I knew the answer to that. I don't think if it does, and it may, uh, stay there for too, too long. Um, but that will depend on what's happening with the U.S. economy relative to the Canadian economy over the coming quarters. And it appears to me the Canadian economy has much weaker footing, especially under weaker oil prices. So again, what's this purple line? This is oil prices. So purple line up, green line up, Canadian dollar weaker. I think there should be a relative floor uh, under oil prices in the high 60s here. So 70, 60, this is in inverted, the way we're looking at it. This graph over here is the two-year spread that is uh, quickly approaching 100 basis points. Um, so there's much more yield available in the U.S., and that's likely to persist for several quarters more. Um, when does the Fed then get more aggressive in the rate cuts? When their labor market softens significantly. So, you know, that's kind of the dynamic here uh, at play. Um, but let's have a look at TLT, because remember weeks ago we told you don't chase the bond rally. You know, you don't want to buy TLT. It's facing, you know, a massive amount of resistance. Um, and while we thought it might be possible to get uh, a little bit lower on yields, higher in price in terms of the long bond, we didn't think the risk reward was attractive and, and we really hedged our bond portfolio. You know, our, our bond portfolio at Q Wealth Partners this year is, is up around nine and a half percent. And you compare that to the average bond fund in Canada today or ETF on a year to date basis, that's up somewhere less than 3% uh, right now. So, you know, active interest rate management is a really, really important part of portfolios. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you think about where, when's that recession coming to the U.S.? And obviously, we walk that back with the stronger data. And until that labor market, when that labor market breaks in the U.S., you can bet we're going to 110 on TLT, but not until. So my point being here and why I bring it up is as yields rise under the monumental supply of treasuries that needs to be issued on a go-forward basis, that is your opportunity to buy fixed income and get defensive. So it's starting to get interesting because equities are at their high point, even though Goldman Sachs came out this week and said seasonality patterns, S&P could hit 62 or 6,300 by the end of the year. Those seasonal patterns that are strong in the fourth quarter work best when the third quarter was crappy and the third quarter hasn't been crappy. Um, you know, from with, with stocks at all time highs today. So we didn't get the seasonal correction and it didn't stick. We saw periods of it in August and September, but none of it stuck. So the positive seasonal for Q4 isn't likely going to be there. Now, that brings us to the U.S. election and what might happen with the U.S. election. And it's it is too close to call. It is about Pennsylvania, in my mind. Um, I was offered a bet last week, actually, uh, and the person want, taking the bet would say, give me two to one odds, but I believe Trump is going to win all the swing states. Obviously, if he does that, he's going to be the president again. But the odds of him winning all the swing states, uh, to me, is worse than two to one. So that's a bet that, uh, you know, I'd want to make at this point. And I would hedge that out. Um, with a single bet on a single state and really put the, you know, like an arbitrage tr <laughs> in, uh, trade there. Anyways, um, put that aside for now. It's too close to call, but I do believe, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, we heard from um, Stanley Druckenmiller this week. Uh, he did a big interview and he basically said, all the internals of the market are telling you Trump's going to win the election when you look at what's going up relative to what's going down. So the ESG stuff, the green stuff has been underperforming and the stuff that would benefit from, you know, continued tax cuts and, and some of Trump's 
policy narratives uh, are, are performing better. So the market actually believes that Trump is going to be the president. And in my mind, if we get Trump as the president and Congress, the Senate will almost certainly go GOP and Congress full uh, Republican sweep. I believe that that is the worst possible outcome for the long bond and then ultimately for the cost of money and what that means for equity multiples. So there's there's a lot more to go, but but November is shaping up to be very, very interesting. So what is Dr. Copper telling us about global growth? No, copper is going to be a major part of electrifying the world. And Trump or no Trump, we're going in that direction, iterating towards in, in fits and starts. So I, I like Dr. Copper here from a long, long, long-term bullish perspective. Um, but when you look at the charts, you, you kind of see fail, breakout, fail, breakout, fail, breakout. But at the same time, okay, big correction, higher lows, right? So that tells you a lot about long-term trend, but it also tells you in the short run, you know, maybe we're capped. So when it comes to mining stocks, not, not precious metals, but, but, but base metals, you know, buy the pullbacks, don't chase the breakouts at this point. So let's talk about the PMs because, you know, what's happening in gold here with bond yields backing up is very, very interesting. Those two don't correlate well together. So, it, you know, it tells you a lot of money is seeing where the fiscal purse is going and it's unmanageable and there's just a lot of money buying real assets. Those real assets are not the economically sensitive ones today, you know, like housing and in particular oil um, and sort of your base metal commodities. The money's going into precious metals, which tells you that people are really worried about the inflationary outlook of fiscal um, and monetary policy going forward uh, if there was a full Trump sweep. So, you know, that leads me to look at the last thing we're going to look at today, which is DJT, uh, formerly known as a SPAC. Um, I, I think this company is a bust. I think it's worth absolutely nothing, um, especially if Trump loses the election. This thing is back at $10 at best in that scenario. Um, Put spreads, all kinds of strategies, bearish strategies here um, would be interesting. Ratio put spread that doesn't cost you anything kind of thing. Um, anyways, th yeah, our trading desk this week at Q Wealth was talking about some of these. And actually, my son, Brandon, uh, put on some trades for his own personal account that would benefit from, um, you know, uh, a move lower here where you're long... Um, you're long a uh, $10 put, but you sold a $10 put a little bit further out. And that makes sense from a, a timing and a trade perspective around trading the election here. So it looks kind of interesting. Um, but the market seemed to be pricing that in, failed at the 200 day, as you might imagine, for the technical traders out there. Uh, but no real break in the chart. Looked like a few days ago we were going to get that reversal pattern here looked really ominous, but there was no follow through. So, you know, a support basis, if we see $25 give way in DJT, that would be a, a, a vote to me that people are saying Trump won't win. So something to watch out for in the next couple of weeks. Have a great uh, end of the season here. I'll be on the golf course as you're seeing this. So, uh, uh, wish me luck uh, out there this week. Looks like a very nice weekend, at least in the GTA. Have a great one, everybody.